Hey, good evening, everybody. This is the first uh, minute where I tell you if you're just showing up to smash the like button, smash the like button. Some people get triggered by me telling you uh, to smash the like button. And uh, my message is, is of course, smash the like button uh, to those who are uh, bothered by it. Uh, later on, uh, I'll be taking some super chats. Uh, those are really helpful for the channel. And I'll answer questions. If you're coming in, hit the like button immediately. I'll get to <laughs> I'll get to your super chat questions in a little bit. Um, and uh, if you haven't yet, of course, make sure you're subscribed to the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. Hit the bell so you get the notifications. And of course, smash the like button as soon as you get on board to the stream tomorrow night. Excuse me, Dr. Cornell West making his debut on the Michael Brooks Show. Adolph Reed Jr., Lula da Silva, come on. Incredible guests and incredibly excited and incredibly honored to have Dr. West on tonight. Talk about prophetic spirituality, the moment we're in, and so much more. Um, I'm really, really stoked for that. And of course, uh, I'll definitely say, if you're in a position to do it, uh, if you have the resources, if you go and become a patron at the Michael Brooks Show, patreon.com slash TMBS, you get way more con uh, content. And I'll leave it at that. But for people who are patrons, talk about it in the chat. Talk about how much, uh, how good it is to be a patron. Thursday, we're streaming with Brian Mayer about Corona in Brazil. Then Stephen Cook on the global oil shocks. Uh, and of course, there's gonna be additional Patreon content. And if you're new to the channel, go check out the backlog. And 102 people watching, go hit the like button. So uh, guys, I just wanna say, I think that some people, it's, it's reminding me in some ways of 2016 where people were really naive about Donald Trump becoming president. Now, I, look, I was wrong. I thought Hillary Clinton would come through in the general election. I always thought Donald Trump would win the Republican primary. I thought that was a no brainer out of the gate. He's the absolute perfect candidate for the Republican uh, party. Um, but a lot of people were just unwilling to see the very obvious path that Donald Trump had through the Rust Belt. And of course, combined with the you know uniquely unappealing nature of the Clintons and the Hillary Clinton campaigns, just arrogance and delusion, uh, Donald Trump was able to slip through. And of course, Donald Trump himself was shocked. I mean, you could look, you could see the shock on his face uh, when he um, won, right? There was a couple of days there where he clearly was not ready, um, you know, even himself mentally to imagine becoming president. And I think that Going into 2020, there is a very strong expectation in the opposite direction. Uh, there's those of us on the left who are absolutely disgusted with the Republican, with the Democratic Party, disgusted with the consolidation to destroy the Bernie movement, disgusted with that base, the fact that there are obviously no real, well, there's certainly, I mean, actually, there are ideological commitments, but they're right wing ideological commitments. They're affluent suburban ideological commitments. Um, and we've also just seen the Democratic Party leadership go along with the Trump administration and the Republican Party in an obscene bailout package that is gonna consolidate corporate power in this country for ages, right? So we, we understand, and the critique of the Democratic Party is very obvious, it's very easy to make, we all make it, and we'll continue to make it, uh, in fact, we're working on a series for patrons really going into how the Obama administration completely sold the country out to Wall Street in the bailouts and the ongoing effect of the Obama administration's, um, you know, completely being synchronized with Wall Street power. At the same time, let's look at some other realities here. And I just want people to be ready because I also want people to look again really strategically at who we want in power. 
Do we want an exhausted and dead and literally dying neoliberalism? Or do we want a smart, opportunistic, and effective new right that can consolidate a governing majority? There's no governing majority that's coming out of a democratic presidency. It's simply a placeholder. Uh, and it allows a lot more room for maneuver. That's one of the reasons that voting strategically in this election is obvious and not that hard to figure out for me. Uh, and I also think it's important because I think a lot of people are banking, unfortunately, on the notion that because the Democratic Party has fucked up so much and they're so disgusting, that they're definitely going to lose. And the numbers don't bear it out. Joe Biden has a lot of, ha, is leading in most polls, including a healthy lead so far in the battleground polls. The polls are starting to catch up with Donald Trump in terms of his handling of the crisis. Uh, obviously, um, his response to Corona has been a disaster. He can't bank on a strong economy anymore. He's leading us into a depression. So a lot of kind of very obvious things several months ago that would have favored any incumbent are completely snatched away from Donald Trump. And that is in the context, too, of him being unusually popular with his base, but not popular as a whole. Most of his polls have not cleared 50%. Uh, you know, he reached, a, you know, he peaked actually around during all the impeachment nonsense uh, in the early, in the lower 50s. But generally, the guy is not particularly popular. And there is a perception of the endless corruption and bullshit and drama of this administration. There's also really interesting polling by Stan Greenberg, uh, who is a, you know, a very, uh, you know, uh, I mean, not actually, he hasn't been Clinton aligned for a long time, but a very mainline Democratic pollster. He did the research on the Reagan Democrats in the 80s, uh, which is very important to look at. And he has a new book out called RIP GOP, which is, you know, again, it's way over optimistic and, um, relatively too easy on the Democratic Party, although for a Democratic strategist, he's very clear about the failings of the Obama administration and the Clinton campaign to kind of um, at least address some concerns about income inequality and the affordability crisis in this country. So he is basically saying, though, and one of the really, he's very confident that Trump will be blown out. One of the things that's very interesting is that in his numbers uh, in most parts of the country, uh, there's actually very favorable attitudes towards immigration. And he makes the point that in 2018, when Trump really doubled down on the most xenophobia and the most fear-mongering, he was repudiated in 2018 in the midterms. And of course, he wasn't repudiated in a particularly, um, you know, 2018 midterms were not a big left turnout. They were a anti-Trump suburbs vote. And that isn't the Bernie coalition, and that is not the long term uh, for truly transformative class based politics we need, but it is an, a solid anti Trump vote. Now, all that being said, if anybody could fuck anything up, if anybody could snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory, it's of course the corporate Democratic Party. Obviously, uh, Donald Trump's campaign is putting out excellent ads. That's an objective statement. Uh, I think it's quite, you know, I'm. I'm actually looking forward to Donald Trump's tantrums uh, when and if he loses. But obviously the Democratic Party, and I think most leaders and, and consultants and pundits are totally content with Donald Trump to be reelected. There's all sorts of money to raise. There's all sorts of pontificating on TV. They are not invested in winning. I completely agree with Adam Kasparian and Omiki Konst on that. Um, and absolutely they can fuck it up. Um, they're filled with just utter mediocrities and incompetence and, you know, just, you know, affluent corporatists uh, with no imaginations. That being said, the fundamental dynamics are in place uh, and the polls indicate that Donald Trump is in a lot of trouble. That is a good thing in and of itself. And beyond that, uh, I don't want to build a left argument that is predicated on some idea that Trump will definitely lose. We're right regardless. We're right about the long-term historical trends in terms of the limits of capitalism, the ecological crisis we're in, the fact that building a dynamic and powerful labor movement is the most important thing that needs to happen right now, period. That it needs to be transnational, that it needs to really you know, revitalize itself across the United States where labor has been decimated for decades. We know this. Um, 
And whether or not uh, some trash candidate like Joe Biden is able to get through uh, because Donald Trump is an absolute grotesque, racist, sexist fucking mess, uh, which I think is actually pretty likely, especially as we're going into a Great Depression that he facilitated. Don't make your arguments based on the idea, uh, you know, that that's an inevitability that he'll get reelected. It's definitely not. Also, yeah, his ads are great. His ads are better. But I also think people, you know, on both sides of this, just like, you know, kind of silly libs think that, you know, owning Trump is what's going to make him lose or whatever. And mostly that doesn't matter. And great ads are great ads. They will play a role. Uh, you know, obviously Trump's ads are better. Trump himself is better as a political performer. Does that really contradict the fundamental dynamics of a pandemic and a depression? I doubt it. Uh, I think with regards to the earlier question, I think that Shahid is in contention. It's a massive uphill battle. Getting Shahid elected and defeating Nancy Pelosi would be an incredible achievement for democracy, for progress. Shahid's a great candidate. That's why I've interviewed him a couple of times. And I think we should support him. We should also support Michaela Wilkes. She's running a really strong race against Steny Hoyer. And one or both of those things, while against every type of odds, would be extraordinarily powerful, transformative elections. Guys, if you want to hit me with Super Chats, now is the time. I see people letting their friends know how good it is to be a TMBS patron. Uh, we're continuing to grow and, and do well, uh, but we got to keep uh, uh, moving forward our targets of getting a next goal of 4,000 patrons and ultimately resting at about 6,000 patrons. We're also working on a couple of TMBS guidebooks, which I'm really excited about, from uh, left-wing strategy, movement building with Joshua Khan Russell, and I think potentially one on uh, Samir Amin's ideas and uh, contemporary African politics with the great Milton Alamadi. If you're just showing up or if you haven't yet hit the like button, it's time and uh, uh, guys, I'll, you know, usually we do a lot on the Super Chats, um, so I'm waiting for those. If you want to go hit with the Super Chats, we'll keep going. If not, um, we can end a little bit earlier. But I think it's really important uh, to, of course, not only see the great opportunity of Trump being out of there, but also recognize that, uh, you know, you shouldn't think there's some type of inevitability to him continuing at all. You can't just show up at erratic hours. <laughs> Usually if I do a live stream and it's going to be at around nine, between nine and 10 on a weeknight, but I can't do specific days. There's so much stuff cooking. I've got this great new Jacobin show. Everybody go subscribe to the Jacobin, watch weekends with Anna Kasparian and Michael Brooks, watch all of the Jacobin teaching series. They're great. Uh, but then you've also, I've also got Woke Bros with Na, uh, with a uh, Waz and Nanda Vila. And, uh, I mean, now we're doing like, and two days a week on Majority Report, and now we're doing like basically four shows a week with TMBS, uh, and I'm promoting the new book. How many people have gone to Red Emma's or their best local independent bookstore and ordered a copy of Against the Web, The Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right, my new book, published by Zero Books, going to be released on April 24th. I am super stoked about that. Right-wing Nancy Pelosi impression. Isn't Nancy Pelosi already a right-wing impression? But I could see her like, I mean, I, I think it would be, I, I don't also, I'm trying to think of a Nancy Pelosi voice. What is it? It's like, stop calling my office to complain and eat chocolate. Or it was, I like the one, I like the meme of her dealing with Corona while like washing her hands with like a slick clap back like she did to Trump, like all these ridiculous libs think to be the extent of, uh, of leadership. Um, if you haven't yet hit the like button and certainly, yeah, that is more like a Susan Collins impression. I remember when Susan, when I was doing the Susan Collins like insult, insult materials or it's like, I think that you're so fat, more about Kashmir soon, history of JKLM. Definitely more about Kashmir, more about Asia in general. I'm gearing up to do a lot more coverage on China, 
a lot more coverage on India, and then, you know, to some extent, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, we need to be quite engaged with the continent. And China is, of course, vitally important, but it's not just China and also Pakistan. Aisha, thank you. You're doing fantastic work, Michael. What do you see the Latino community doing electorally? If a coherent pattern is even discernible. Well, one as always, I always caution with the kind of broad demographic reads because I do think that, you know, I, I again, it's very important. We've always got to read our Adolf Reed, our Torre Reed, our Joanna Vist, uh, you know, the Hispanic community is enormously diverse electorally and in terms of class interests and identities and so on. But I think, look, that is a really strong left block. I have no doubt about it. And I also think that there's gonna be a lot of folks, uh, you know, who are not excited about some asshole like Joe Biden, but I do think they'll be extremely motivated to vote Donald Trump out of office. And I think that bodes very well for Democrats in the sub belt, in the uh, sun belt. What's your favorite left political documentary? That's an interesting question. Um, my favorite left political documentary. Well, actually, we're working on the next illicit history is going to be one on Thomas Sankara, but I uh, would suggest an upright man. Uh, 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 that is a fantastic one. You spoke to uh, Destiny a while ago. Would you speak to Vosh on voter shaming? I, I'm not totally sure who Vosh is. Uh, I think I've heard of him. I think he sounds cool. Uh, but I'm not, I am really not interested in internet debates. Um, I think the debate I had with Sagar and Jetty on socialism versus nationalism, how it relates to foreign policy with China was productive and fascinating. I kind of want to do a debate with my buddy uh, Thaddeus Russell, who I would describe as some type of kind of quasi, I mean, I think he is basically libertarian. His politics are more interesting than that, but we have a lot of disagreements. I'm really interested in debates that could potentially open up bigger themes, not kind of internet pedantry. TMBS is awesome, left is best, but we need to win, we need to take power, absolutely. Please interview Alex Morris, he's challenging Richard Neal in mass first, we need to start ousting down leadership establishment. Well, I'll look into him. I need to learn a lot of more about him as a candidate. Uh, and I gotta say too, I'm not totally, I'm, I've interviewed some great people running. I've, in, you know, Michaela Wilkes, Satish, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, Buttar, um, and, uh, and, and Isaiah James. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of really good people running. I've interviewed some others, but I, I think much more likely, I will say this, as far as guests that are kind of in the field going, I think it's much more likely you'll be seeing people who are labor organizers on the show, who are doing strategy for labor unions and potentially involved in other different types of movements. What do you think of Alan Moore? I don't know who Alan Moore is. <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea who that is. I apologize. Um, and uh, we did interview Re Rebecca Parson. You could check that out. I'm pretty sure if she's running in Washington, she actually has been one of our guests. Um, so I think, that, I think that we need to really, really, really work um, you know, more broadly. And I, and I also, I, I'm, I want these electoral efforts to be successful because I also think that there is a troubling dynamic when a lot of people run uh, with these great campaigns and these great candidates and there's a lot of losses. You know, I, I, I wanna really start recalibrating everything we're doing strategically. And I think as an example, if you haven't watched yet, the interview I did with Chris Smalls, who's organizing the Amazon strike, that's the most important interview, the conversations with Richard Wolf on strikes, on how Marx looks at labor. The funny kind of mixture right now is getting to some really important big picture theoretical questions, the international dynamics we're in, the philosophical and spiritual uh, dimensions. Uh, and then I think conversations with people who are really doing, you know, very direct line action in terms of strikes, in terms of walkouts. And again, always labor and mass labor movements are by far, by far, infinitely the most important thing uh, without a doubt. Have you read or listened to any Michael Parenti? I, I did years ago like when I was a teenager. I mean, I'm certainly familiar with his name as kind of one of the greats, but I uh, have never kept up with him that closely. 
Um, you know, I've read a, a lot more Amir, uh, Samina, uh, Samina Amir uh, than him as an example. And I've, you know, certainly more familiar with David Harvey and Richard Wolf. When's your Chomsky interview? I'm not sure, but I will tell you this. We're working on it. Um, but I mean, again, I'm just, I'm, you know, Zizek. I love interviewing Zizek, and I'm extraordinarily excited about the Cornell West interview, obviously. Um, how many people have ever, has everybody watched the interview already with President Lula that we did? Uh, me and the guys from Brazil Wire. If you aren't reading Brazil Wire, you really should be reading Brazil Wire and following Brian Mayer's work on Telesaur. And you should be following Telesaur for all coverage on Latin America and the Caribbean. It's an incredibly incredible uh, source of, of real reporting on U.S. hegemonic influence on political terrorism in Latin America aimed today at Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, um, and elsewhere, as well as the coup in Bolivia uh, and, and elsewhere. Zizek, uh, Chomsky says Zizek is someone who uses fancy words but is incoherent. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I just simply don't agree at all with Chomsky on that. I Look, I think there's some people who you can be into continental philosophy or not. Um, you can be interested in Lacan or not. But I, I don't buy that kind of very narrow positivist stuff. Um, no, Zizek, yeah, and Zizek's entertaining and Zizek's fun. But the ideas, and if you read them, are actually extremely challenging. And so that kind of critique just sort of, you know, it kind of reminds me of a sort of, you know, kind of new atheist. I mean, look, I have a great respect, obviously, for Noam Chomsky. I read a ton of Chomsky, and he's a big influence on me. But uh, his critique and some of the things that have been published about Zizek are disappointing. And, you know, a lot of them are just kind of mean-spirited fucking bullshit. And we can do a lot better. Zizek's great. Agree, disagree. Zizek's great. You want Zizek as part of the mix, of course. You and Vash should have a productive conversation. You could talk about optics and rhetoric on the left. He's got a neat approach, very strategic. Well, that's awesome. That sounds good to me. I'm all about that. Justin, uh, Joe Biden and Justin Bieber share the same initials. Is Joe to progressivism what Justin is to music? Well, I mean, Justin is a musician. Joe has nothing to do with progressivism. I mean, Joe Biden is by any, productive, uh, any objective criterion, a right-wing political figure. If you have any basic understanding of political theory or economics outside of, you know, the most basic kind of cable news party ID politics. Um, uh, so not exactly a one to one. Uh, Michael, love your work and perspective. I feel like neoliberals like Stephen Bonnell are really hurting the progressive socialist movement. I, I don't know who that is. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of folks are hurting the progressive socialist movement. Um, see your article. I, honestly, just in general, like if you want to pitch me people or whatever, it's cool. I'm not really interested in kind of like getting asked about random people or, you know, kind of internet fights. We're doing bigger stuff here. I mean, these are like the comment. We're having Cornell West on tomorrow. We're building content on China. We've interviewed President Lula. Like, that's the direction we're going in. Uh, science and society, new left in China, its Im implications. Also, the Chinese labor journal made in China, Kevin Lin in particular. Thank you. That sounds really important. I think that, um, how do you feel about Kyle's stance about not voting for Biden? Well, look, I like Kyle a lot. We obviously do good work together. And I would prefer to watch his actual videos uh, then get an impression from Twitter debates. But, you know, my position is clear. I just, I was very clear. And this, you know, triggered people all over the place because there's also just kind of, you know, very silly, naive, vote no matter blue type kind of stuff as well, right? And again, the cold hard truth is that progressives have lost. This is a serious setback. And there isn't going to be any real substantive influence over the Democratic Party right now or over the Biden campaign. I think people who are attempting to do that and doing the working groups and obviously I trust Bernie, you know, all power to them. That's great. But this is a party that if it might even be to the right now of where it was four years ago. The wins of Rashida Tlaib and AOC and Ilhan Omar are great. 
When very importantly, we need to protect Rashida Tlaib's seat from a machine Democrat in Detroit. But the bigger picture and the reality of 2008 is that a lot of these wins are coming on much more kind of never Trump sort of center, center right-ish neoliberal politics. Now, there's a big variety in that, but um, thoughts on the Ben Burgess Conrad Hamilton exchange on China. I haven't watched it yet, but I will put it on my list. So that being said, so when I was saying a couple of weeks ago that I think if there was a world where there was a strategic, there was a plan in place, isn't Warren the best case scenario for uh, uh, VP? No, definitely not. And partially, she's definitely not the best case scenario for VP because she doesn't add anything to the ticket in terms of electability. So if you're concerned about actually winning this thing, and yes, I know the political science, the data shows that the vice president doesn't necessarily lock up their home state or anything like that, but you do need a really, really strong, strong political performer. You need somebody uh, who can um, you know, be an asset on the campaign. And frankly, I just see Elizabeth, I mean, Elizabeth Warren could not handle campaigning against Bernie Sanders without whining and going to the refs. That's not gonna work in a general election. And I don't really relish several months of you know Sleepy Joe and Pocahontas material. And no, I don't think Elizabeth Warren has a comprehensive progressive vision at all. I have actually, frankly, much more trust uh, in the sort of overall record, frankly, of somebody is like Tammy Baldwin, but I'm pretty confident that the pick, I think Harris will be the pick. I don't know anything, but that would be my guess. Stephen Bonnell's destiny. What I'm saying is that in order for progress to move to the wind, destiny needs to be exposed. Would you debate him again? Oh, uh, probably not. Um, I just, honestly, that stuff in general is just very boring to me. Do you ever feel you're much, do you ever feel you're too much focused on your head and focused on philosophizing and book knowledge? When is the book on left-wing strategy and movement pivot? I don't feel like that. Uh, I think that the show covers a lot of extremely practical things. And I also think thinking clearly is actually really important. If you don't have the right methodological maps, uh, then you're fucked. Um, and we're in the process of working on it. I'll have a sense of a timeline soon. Larry Kudlow and the protests happening right now. Uh, people want to get back to work. And you can go back to work if what you do is you drink a little bit of Jim Beam. And you go, and then you're going to go back out. And because people want to make money, like Rosa Parks wanted to make money. And for heaven's sake, they should be able to do it. What do you think of LG District 01 as any chance of ousting, ousting Lee uh, Zeldin? I have no idea about that race. None whatsoever. If you're just arriving, hit the like button. Make sure you hit the like button. If you have not yet, hit subscribe to the channel. And folks, if you're a patron, let other people in the chat know why being a patron is such a good idea. Michael, your convo with Reed was wonderful, kind of depressing, upshot, but necessary. Have you read Sheldon Wolin as a fugitive democracy? No, but I will look it up and thank you. I mean, Adolf Reed is just a giant. Love your channel. Can you recommend some books on the history of US foreign policy, economics, whatever uh, you find to be essential for reading on the left? Um, you know what, read David Harvey's history of neoliberalism and I'm gonna do a stream soon where I will pick up, uh, I'll, I'll try to at least recommend a couple books because I get asked that a lot. And I have also Ghost Wars by Steve Call, but I really need to, to kind of sit down and, and think of a decent little list. Did you see what happened to Nova Scotia's uh, worst shooting in Canadian history? He was burning homes and impersonating cops and it was a 12 hour manhunt. Oh, that's horrible, really sorry. That is really horrible. Thoughts on the forthcoming bailout package? Will any vo Dems vote against it? Uh, well, I think AOC is planning to vote against it. It looks like another failure, um, frankly. I, I just don't see it. Um, I just don't see it. I think, you know, it's the fact that Schumer and Pelosi are, beg are bragging about hospital funding as a win when First of all, that should be obvious and everybody, and not even a question in the middle of the pandemic. And secondly, that if the Republicans were actually gonna hold that up, that you would make sure that they would pay an enormous political price for it. I, I, you know, the complete political malpractice of the Democratic leadership is actually genuinely amazing. 
Uh, what well, you were wrong on open borders. Chomsky says open borders would be a type ch pi Koch brothers pipe dream because they would have unlimited labor at low cost. Well, I don't know what Chomsky says, and I don't know that you know my position on open borders, um, which is obviously they're not happening anytime soon. Uh, so I've actually spoken against the sort of utopian rhetoric in an electoral context, and they would not happen immediately. Um, When's the next podcast with Lev, Rev Left, favorite leftist historical figure? I don't know. I had a really good time talking with Brett. We did a Patreon episode for TMBS. I was on his show. That was really fun. My favorite leftist historical figure, I guess, of those who have passed. Uh, at the moment, Cabral, because I'm reading a lot of uh, Cabral. And I think, you know, and, and just that idea of revolutionary truth telling that Paul O'Connell brought up in the context of the conversation last week, uh, was awesome. Do you ever see, did you ever see the Jank Uger Ben Shapiro debate? No, I didn't. Um, so I'll just say again, guys, if you're rolling on, make sure we've got 834 people watching. You all are awesome. 325 likes. Let's get that to over 500 likes now. And also, if you haven't yet, definitely make sure that you hit subscribe and you hit the bell, you get the notification and read in the comments why it's so useful to become a patron and then go do it by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash TMBS. Um, I hope the, you know, the sort of analysis of Trump and the actual state of the election and why he's in incredibly vulnerable shape and people end up obviously the obvious best strategic outcome for the left is obviously for him to lose. It's not that complicated. Um, I hope that all makes sense. If you guys have any more questions, uh, just a few more minutes here, you can hit me on the super chat. As always, I really hope that everybody is staying safe and healthy. I hope people's families are okay. I hope um, if you have the opportunity that you are taking this time to read, to watch documentaries, to relax a little bit. Uh, so exciting for your, excited for your interview with Dr. West, having a very hard time working in a COVID surge emotionally. So much death every day. This will make my week. Well, Eric, thank you, brother. Eric's a doctor. Thank you so much for what you do, man. And I am so excited to talk to Dr. West. Uh, that is another major point for the show. And everybody, if you have time, just go on YouTube and watch Cornell West Talks. It will elevate you. I'm geographically isolated and overworked socialist. The nearest DSA chapter is an SAC and too far from my busy life. What can I do to help the much broader effort? Um, well, I know that if you look up some of the stuff that Megan Day is talking about, um, and I would really be curious if, if, as an example, you want to continue with DSA, there's going to be way more opportunities for virtual engagement and teach-ins. And that's what I'd look, in, look at right now. Um, I'd look at uh, ways of getting involved with and if there's any way you can support, you know, the efforts of the Amazon strikers, the Teamsters uh, and others. Um, we're going to be doing a show pretty focused on this, not tomorrow, but next week with a Teamster organizer and another strike organizer. Biden was behind the 2002 Rave Act that made MDMA schedule one drug. I don't want to vote for him. Should I? I would if you were in a swing state. Thoughts on, I mean, and, and look again, I, he is fucking trash. <laughs> Thoughts on Andrew Romanoff, Senate, Senator, a Senator from Colorado. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously I would, I think, uh, you know, he would be an upgrade. I mean, he's no, you know, great, you know, progressive force or anything, but I think he would be, you know, genuinely center left and move in a decent direction on some environmental policies. Obviously I'd vote for him over Gardner, of course. Some people in the socialist left are replicating a type of cancer culture they've critiqued. Lots of people are going after Lee Fang and Mehdi Hassan, for example. How do you combat this? Well, look, again, I think here's the thing is that I really want to get to a point where you can critique people. You can have strong disagreements without that leading to that melodrama of them being over for whatever. I have disagreements with all three of those guys. Um, you know, some more than others. Look. I will say right now, Mehdi Hassan is being extraordinarily obnoxious and he's not helping his efforts by how he's going about it. But Mehdi Hassan also does plenty of good work. Uh, and you know, yeah, I, I, I just think we need, just need to keep registering it 
and not go along with the dog piles on anyone. People make mistakes, people, and you know, occasionally you have to disaggregate and find like a purely cynical actor. Uh, but I'm not, you know, I certainly wouldn't identify any of those three, uh, you know, in that way at all. I think some of the, I think actually Lee Fang makes a lot of really cogent points. Um, and, you know, Ryan, I mean, the baseline disagreement with Ryan is on Elizabeth Warren. Uh, you know, and yeah, look, I've, I've found defending Elizabeth Warren to be just shocking and make no sense for a really long time. But that has nothing to, you know, again, Ryan does great work. He's a really good guy. I, that's the ethos you got to cultivate. That is not in any way contradiction, contradictory of doing really, really rigorous argumentation. Sam are uh, ordering chicken nuggets at Wendy's. No, because I, I asked for the other nuggets and then I got, yes, I'll wait because I wanted the chicken nuggets and I thought I was very clear about it. I didn't go to Burger King. I went to Wendy's. Yeah, this is really ridiculous. I host a daily talk show. Please explain what neoliberal actually means. Many use the term and slam it, but I suspect that the others don't know what it means. I know I don't. Well, I've done several videos on this. I'd look it up, um, but I mean, roughly, I think you could look at neoliberalism as sort of a reconstitution of politics starting in the 70s and 80s of kind of marketization, privatization of public services, and the idea that market mechanisms are basically the best way to solve social problems. Um, that's honestly, I wish I could give you a more elegant definition. We've done more in-depth videos on it. I agree with you though. I would definitely watch the illicit history, the implosion of neoliberalism of Mark Blythe as soon as this is over, go watch that illicit history. I think uh, that's a good place to start. How do you maintain the hope that the US will address the climate crisis under the shadow of a Biden nomination? I don't know what that means. Uh, I, you, you have to maintain some hope until you stop breathing. Do Civil War era Sam Harris impression. <laughs> that was a whole video. I forget, well, didn't we do that bit like, uh, oh, it was like, it's like Nat Turner. Um, you know, you, we have to be serious about this. What if Nat Turner had a nuclear weapon? Now I'm not saying, I, look, I abhor slavery, but Abraham Lincoln was a fanatic. Um, dream travel destination if you haven't already. That is a great question. Um, Right now, at this moment, I would really like to go to Japan. So there's plenty of places I want to go back to again, and there's a ton of places I haven't been to yet. I uh, definitely want to go to Cuba. Uh, but this moment, if you told me I could just fly, fly anywhere, uh, right now I would take that trip to Japan. Folks, let's get to over 500 likes. Why don't you just go smash that like button and also... Um, while you're at it, make sure that you uh, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and read the comments and check out all of the people who will tell you how awesome it is to be a TMBS patron and get the whole experience. Go watch the last post game that we unlocked. That was a huge amount of fun. We unlocked the post game. You can watch the whole thing on the YouTube channel and it'll give you a flavor. Of, you get all the shows as a Brooks Brothers patron, patreon.com slash TMBS. Any more questions? Any more questions for the super chat? Before I call it a day, just wanted to thank you for extending your efforts, uh, even extending to the weekends now. You and Anna and Jackman are awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so honored by that. And go to Jackman, hit subscribe, and watch Anna and I's show. I love doing it. Mike, Mikey Rocks. Rocks the God. Thank you for everything. Thank you back, man. Much love. Loving the new weekend show with Anna Kasparian. You're both killing it. Keep up the good work. Thank you, brother. Much appreciated. And they're also, you know, clipping our shows on the Jackman channel. So there's a huge amount of content on the Jackman channel. Uh, if you haven't gone over there and checked it out yet, subscribe. I definitely do that. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because there is going to be some arguments and some things in the uh, coming months where I am going to legitimately say that there's a third way. We need to find an intelligent way of talking about China that rejects a new Cold War. 
fights back against xenophobia, fear-mongering, and the delusion of neoconservatives while also re-embracing repatriating supply chains and having a serious conversation about international power dynamics, U.S. imperial aggression, while at the same time not denying the fact that the Chinese have plenty of their own problems and human rights violations. I just said everything that I think in a Bill Clinton voice. <laughs> Um, that Bill Clinton voice can get hard on the throat. Would you vote for Jordan Peterson over Joe Biden? Probably not. Uh, how do you get people to understand political effects for their everyday lives, like with wages and healthcare and prosperity rather than just libertarian BS? Uh, watching shows like this, asking them about their student debts, asking them who has more power over their lives, their work, their bosses, or their government. Really looking forward to reading your book this week, Michael. You guys doing a reading from Ruben's book and comes out soon after yours. Yes, of, of course we'll do that. That'll be hilarious. What are your thoughts on Tom Cotton? Uh, Jane, dangerous, formidable. Josh Hawley is the most dangerous and the most formidable. Love all your work. Thanks to Mike and the crew. Thank you. Does the left need its own Frank Luntz? The left needs better strategy and better communication, but Frank Luntz, no, I think Frank Luntz is honestly kind of a fucking, a little bit of a goofball, but it does need much more strategy. Um, the thing is, though, is that actual labor power is going to be the base of it because there's never going to be an equivalent left-wing role for just reframing and buzzwords like there is for the right because the whole terrain favors the right. Favorite wire character in Sopranos? My favorite character in The Sopranos is Tony or Polly Walnuts. My favorite character on The Wire is... Um, Avon Barksdale, love your work, inspiring stuff. Thank you so much. Did you see the former Australian liberal PM said in his new book that News Corp serves as a political actor for far right uprisings in Australia? No, I didn't, but I will check that out. Antievictionmap.com is a great resource now. Uh, yeah, that's very important uh, that people look up those things and also look up uh, the resources on rent strikes. And if their landlords are threatening you, uh, or have illegally looked at your tax return or seen, or seen if you've gotten your stimulus check, uh, you should be definitely seeking legal counsel about that sort of thing. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to sign off. Appreciate all of you immensely. Thank you, Joshua. If you haven't yet, in the last few seconds here, hit the like button. If you want to throw a final super chat, much appreciated. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell. Make sure you read the comments about all the benefits you get as a patron. Tomorrow, we're back, we're covering a ton of stuff, including the new power sharing agreement in Israel, how COVID-19 is hitting the global south. And uh, of course, we're having the debut of Dr. Cornell West. Could not be more excited about that. Please bring on Peter Joseph, new human rights movement. Yes, we just, I think actually, I just started following him back on Twitter. I'll look more into that stuff. Uh, but also in that general world, we're going to do more content on resiliency, ecology. I would check out Michelle Bowen's The Peer-to-Peer -peer Movement, Jesse, Jeremy uh, Johnson and Mutations, Brent Cooper and Abstract, uh, and the Meta Modern Movement. I am definitely open to some of those ideas. Some of them are really important and really dynamic and definitely connected uh, with a project of reclaiming and renewing the commons scientific, ecological, technological, artistic, and cultural. Peace and love, everybody. Really appreciate all of you. If you haven't yet, hit the like button. Much love. Thanks, guys.